We're going to talk now about crash recovery and logging. So here's the problem when you've got a file system. Uh, when you have a crash, you can get an inconsistent file system. One possible solution is go through and do a check of the entire file system on boot if it didn't shut down cleanly. A second possibility is do logging to try and prevent errors. We're going to look at that logging approach. So you write in the file system, and all of a sudden, the power fails. And you reboot, and the question is, is your file system still usable or not? Or is it usable with a little amount of work, or usable with a lot amount of work? The big problem is, what if you're crashing during some multi-step operation? Okay, So there may be some file system invariants that are temporarily violated. So you may have to write, let's say, three blocks. And before you write those three blocks, the file system invariants are maintained. After you write those three blocks, the file system invariants are maintained. But in the middle, between those three, the file system invariants may be violated. So after the reboot, if you're not careful, I mean, the bad thing that happens is you crash again because you have some corrupt file system. Okay? Or even worse might be you don't have a crash, but your reads and writes are reading and writing incorrect data. So what are examples? Well, here's one example. Let's say you do a create, all right? So we're doing a create of a file. And what are some of the steps we do that? We are going to create a new directory entry, and we're going to allocate an inode. If the ordering that these happen is that we write the new directory entry first, before we've actually written the inode, then we've got a big problem because we've got a directory entry that's pointing to a free inode. If we do it in the other approach, that actually the write first writes the inode and shows that it's in use, and then we crash before we actually write the directory entry, then it's not so bad, right? We have got a unused inode. Uh, so it's not free, but it's not used. So it, it's wasted. So that's not certainly not as bad as having this directory entry point at a non-existent inode, or rather a free inode. Uh, other examples of what might happen? Let's say we do a write. So what, what actually is written during our write? So we've got to write, let's say we're allocating a new block. So we've got the addresses in the inode themselves, and we have the size. We've got the indirect block. We've got, let's say, the contents of the data block, right? So the data block contents. And we've also got the block-free bitmap. OK, so all of these four need to be written successfully in order to complete the write. What are some ways in which this can go wrong? So one way is maybe the block-free bitmap doesn't get written, in which case now we've got an inode referring to a block that is actually marked as free and is going to be reallocated at some point. That's a disaster. Okay. Again, maybe we marked it as not free and nothing else happened, right? in which case now again we've used a block that we'll never get back again. Well, let's look at another example, unlink. So in an unlink, we're, what do we have to update? The block-free bitmap. We have to uh, free the inode, assuming that this was the last link. We have to erase the directory entry. Ways in which this goes bad, well, probably the first, the worst way is when we have marked it as free, and yet it's actually still in use by the inode. In the directory entry. Or what would be bad is if these first two happen and the third one doesn't happen. Ideally, we'd really like these to be all or nothing, right, in some sort of a transaction. So we want our after a our, our, our reboot, what we'd like, and after running some sort of a recovery code, we'd like our internal invariants to be maintained. What's, a, what's an internal invariant? Well, let's do a simple one. That a block is not in both the free list and 
in a file. And so, so let's let's try that number one. We want after reboot and running recovery code. One file system invariance maintained. What might be another file system invariant? Well, let's say the link count in an inode should match the number of directory entries that refer to that file. That's a, a fairly simple one. Uh, an inode should be marked as free only if there are links to it. And the second thing we want, right, one way we, one way we could maintain this is if we, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, erased the file system, we'd certainly get that file system invariant maintained. But of course, we also want preservation. So we want all but the last few operations, let's say, uh, to be preserved on the disk. So if we wrote something yesterday, uh, we certainly want that to be maintained. And this is, but if we are crashing uh, the write that was just in progress, uh, we're fine if that didn't get uh, preserved to disk. So a user might have to check the last few operations and see did they actually make it or not. We also don't want any order anomalies. Right. So, for example, let's say we have some code that was running that, like, you know, wrote some something to a result, and and also wrote some status. Okay. Our expectation is that if we go look at status, and it says done, then we've got our results in a result file. If, on the other hand, the done got made it to status, but we didn't actually get our result written to the result file, that would be bad. So we want them to be ordered. We have some conflicts, right? We have correctness and performance that we're trying to maintain. So the one big problem is that disk writes are slow. So for safety point of view, for correctness, we want to write to disk as soon as possible. For speed, however, we don't want to write to disk as soon as possible. We might want to batch uh, or have a write back cache. We might want to sort the order the blocks actually get written. And we know the disk drive controller is actually going to do that as well to try and preserve speed. So that's why, even though we may have issued these writes in a certain order, that might not be the order in which they actually get applied to the disk. This is a, a big problem, this crash recovery. It happens often, it happens in databases too, and there's a lot of work that's uh, gone into trying to solve this. There's, there's a lot of ways in which to address this performance correctness trade-off. The approach that we're going to look at to deal with this crash recovery is called logging. This is also known as journaling. So journaling, uh, the idea is we want to have these atomic system calls with respect to crashes. So when you do, for instance, a create, after a crash, either the create completely occurred, that is all the blocks necessary for the create worked, or the, it's as if the create didn't occur at all. Same thing, so this sometimes is called an atomic commit. Uh, and a goal also is we want to have fast recovery. So in the early days of Unix, there used to be something called FSCK. So this was a file system check that you'd run after a crash. And that could take an hour for example, which uh, is really something you don't want to have. So we're going to be looking at two different things. First, we're going to look at how logging, logging is done in XV6. As you can imagine, it's a, it's a small code base. It's a fairly simple approach that still gives us our correctness at the expense of some performance. In a later video, we'll look at Linux's ext3 file system. So ext3 has logging, but is also fast and normal operation. So it has additional code in there to try and increase the speed. So what's the basic idea behind logging? Well, you want atomicity, right? So that's as I described. You want all of a system call or none, 
So what are the effects of a system call on the file system? So let's call this atomic operation a transaction. So a transaction is going to be the changes, the sequence of changes that are made to particular blocks. And what we're going to do then is we're going to record all the writes that a system call will be doing to a disk log. And when I say here read all writes, I really mean not, when I say record all the writes, what I really mean is record all the writes that will happen. Because we don't want to actually do the writing until we've logged it all. So we, instead of writing, actually write to the log. Once we're complete, then we go ahead and commit. The commit is we record done to the log. And then do what's called an install. That is write the log blocks to their proper location. So let's say that we've got a particular system call. Let's say a query system call. And it's going to make, be making changes to three blocks. So here's the file system. And here is the log. So I'm looking at this as outside of the rest of the file system. So outside the log is the actual files and directories and all that sort of stuff. This is just a log. So we're doing executing our system call, and it actually tries to modify a block. So it tries to write a block. So what we do is put it in the log. We don't put it where it should belong, which is somewhere in the file system. The, the system call now makes another change. Put it in the log. Makes another change. Put it in the log. Now, the system call is complete. So we know it's made all the changes that it needs to make. So now we write done. Okay, the equivalent, some sort of a done there. We still haven't made our changes to the actual file system. Right? So if this was a create file, a create of a file, the file is not in the file system. Only once we get one, two, and three in their proper locations on disk have we actually successfully created the file. Now we go ahead and move in and write one at its proper location. We go and write two at its proper location. We go and write three at its proper location, and then we erase, because we're done. So this is the normal case. What's our cost? We have to write every block twice. So, so there's a, a slowdown by a factor of two. So it's, 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 it's a fairly extensive cost. Our advantage, though, is we get both correctness and we get a quick startup. Let's look at what happens if we have a crash. Okay, and let's look at it various stages in this of where the crash is. So let's say we've written the one, and we've written the two, and we crash. We haven't made any changes to the file system yet. We crash, we come back up, we look at the log. Is there a done in the log? No, we ignore this. So it's as if the create didn't happen, which makes sense. The create was in progress, and we have said that our goal is to make sure everything but the most recent few system calls uh, to be preserved in the file system. And in our case, this was uh, a most recent system call, and it's not preserved. That's OK. In fact, we didn't even get three to write in here. So now we write three. Again, if a crash were to occur now, we would still ignore the results. We would just wipe out the log. And now we write done. Now a crash occurs. The recovery code is going to start writing these files on, on disk. So it's going to write one, 
at its proper location. It is not going to erase it here. Then it's going to write 2 at its proper location. Let's say, heaven forbid, a crash occurs again. All right, so we crash. We come back up. We look at the log. The log says there's a done there. So what do we do? We're going to go through and write 1, 2, and 3 go to proper locations. We write 1 uselessly. Right? We write 2 uselessly. If we crashed again, we'd come back. Write 1 uselessly, write 2 uselessly, write 3 uselessly. Right? We write 3. And then, if we were to crash, we come back up, we see it done, we do it again. We do it again until we actually are, are up long enough that we then erase the log. This is called a write-ahead log because we are writing the log ahead of, ahead of actually writing to the file system. And the rule of this log is you write none of the transactions right to the file system until the transaction is committed. How do we know it's committed? Because there's a done. Okay, so until the done is there, nothing goes into the file system. And that rule allows us to be prepared for a crash. Because that ensures that we have all of the transactions right in the log such that they can be replayed. Notice in this replaying, sometimes we were, if we crashed while we were replaying, we, or installing really, so if we crashed while we were installing, we might reinstall certain uh, disk blocks. That's okay. That's because writing a disk block from the log into the file system is what's called idempotent. Idempotency just means that you can do it more than once and you'll end up with the same result. Logging can be difficult. It's, it's, it's difficult when you have mutable data structures. Okay, and uh, Sometimes you're logging on top of some existing storage system as opposed to being integrated within it. One example of a particular problem is, let's say you have a cache. Uh, it can be difficult because normally the cache is going to want to be writing, right? know what block number something is going to, and write it as necessary. But our rule is we can't write to the file system until the transaction is complete. What if the cache runs out of space? It might want to evict some of the entries in the cache in order to read and cache some other data. Uh, so how, let, let me give an example, right? Let's say we have a create, right? So this is going to be, number one here, is going to be, let's say, the dirty inode. Let's say we're doing a create, and so we create, we have to allocate a new inode. So we're going to go have to write that. So we write that to the log, and then we write the directory into block to the log. But before we've committed, the dirty inode actually gets uh, evicted from the block cache to disk. So it actually writes this inode back into the file system. That would be no good. So what we have to make sure to do is make sure the buffer cache, make sure it's big enough to support the number of blocks we need for a um, transaction. And the other thing we need to do is when we've got a block in here, let's say block number one, while we're in the middle of a transaction, we need to pin it. That is, not allow it to be evicted. So set a bit in it that says, this is in use in a transaction, therefore do not write this back to the disk. On a commit, we'll go ahead and unpin.